Good evening, uh, fellow stargazers. Welcome to the uh, April uh, 2021 Astronomy Fundamentals Program of the Naperville Astronomical Association from here in Northeastern Illinois. Uh, thank you for joining us. Let's see if I can get my screen to work again. There we go. <laughs> um, besides that, I will only open up tonight with the usual uh, pre-program announcement of, since you're watching us live, if you are watching us live here, if you have any questions, as always, uh, if you're following us on Facebook, just put them in the comments section and we'll follow that and pass them along to our tonight's speaker. If you uh, are watching us from the club website or just prefer email, you can also send us an email and we'll also be uh, keeping track of that and we'll pass along any uh, questions that are applicable to the program. Uh, tonight's program, we have a, uh, as always with our fundamentals program, one of our members speaking and this evening, uh, Vince is going to talk about uh, observing the sky, not for fun, but for finding your way around on the planet here. And uh, so without further ado, I'm going to turn over the screen and everything to Vince. And uh, so we ready to go there. There we go. I am. Thank you, Drew. Um, uh, welcome, everybody. And this is uh, it's an interesting topic. When Laura first asked me to do this, when I joined, I, I said to myself, wow, I haven't done this in like 25 years, it's been a long time, maybe 20 years. So you get a little fuzzy and this is not a easy thing to do when you're navigating at sea. But what I'm gonna to try to do today is give you some of my perspectives on celestial navigation, why it's so important. Um, some, some of my background in the US Navy, I spent a lot of time there doing celestial navigation. And we're gonna cover fundamentals today. We're not gonna go into too much detail because it can get pretty detailed when you get into celestial navigation. But what I wanna do is make it a little bit fun, a little bit entertaining for you because celestial navigation is something you can do, you know, kind of like a golf or any hobby, playing piano. You can get better and better as the more and more you do it. So we're gonna take you through the basics first. And then what we'll do um, is from there, we'll take you to uh, a better way of understanding, you know, how we navigate at sea, why we use navigation, why it's so integral to everything we do. And importantly, how do you actually do it? And we'll go through a couple of the different exercises to show you how that works. Okay. So um, we'll cover my background. We'll cover navigation through the ages. We'll talk about some tools. We'll talk about some hour angles and some things around the celestial sphere, which you may be familiar with uh, just based on your experience with astronomy. We'll talk about lines of positioning because we're trying to take a three-dimensional object into a two-dimensional object, which is, a, which is a nautical chart. We'll spend a little time on the sextant, which is the tool that we use to uh, get angles. We'll plot those lines of position. We'll talk about navigating with different celestial bodies, Polaris, the stars, the planets. And then we'll get, take you through a whole solution. What does a day at sea look like for a typical navigator, whether you be in the US Navy or whether you're a merchant or just a sailor, you know, out there on a sailboat going around the world. Uh, it's it's uh, something that, you know, you don't need, really need any tools for from an electronic standpoint. Um, we'll get into that. Everything is electronic now, but we're going to go old school tonight and show you sort of how we used to do it, how we still do it and how it's important to do if you do lose, you know, those electronics and so on. So a little bit more my background. Um, I spent time on a variety of different ships. I mentioned these different ships because the, the Meyer Cord was a small ship, maybe only about 447 feet. Uh, the uh, USS New Jersey was a big old battleship from World War II. Um, that was a much, much bigger ship, almost 700 feet. And, um, you know, kind of a classic look there. You see in the bottom left there that, that uh, those big guns there on the 62 is the hull number. Also spent a little time on a submarine. Believe it or not, we did celestial navigation in the submarine when we had the rare opportunity to surface, which wasn't too often. And also on this big flat deck here, this is a helicopter carrier. And um, you can do celestial navigation here. Now it's a little harder when all the jets or the helicopters are moving around, but um, any size ship, you can do it. And then I just show you this little one over here. Uh, this was part of the Nimitz battle group that I was in. And, um, 
it's interesting. You only see pictures like this really kind of close in for the photos because the ships are many, many miles apart and they operate because otherwise you, you, you have issues with running into each other. So they're typically separated pretty far out, but for the pictures, they pull us all in very close. So I tell you all that because it's important. It, navigation is critical to the US Navy and whether it's the electronic version or the old school paper version the celestial, you really need to know what you're doing because it, you'll see as in a moment when I talk about some of the different ways we, we use it, why it's just, it's kind of like breathing almost uh, when, when it comes to, you know, being a Naval officer or, you know, any kind of a seaman out there. Um, the far left is obviously an older photo. <laughs> the far right, right is a little bit more recent. Um, I show you that 1980s mustache just because I guess we all had one back in the 80s. But, um, you know, this is just different times in my career. And I just wanted to share a little bit about, you know, me and, and kind of what I did. I never actually served as a navigator. That's a specific position on the, on the ship <clears throat> that is, you know, full-time job. But I was a deck officer. And so I spent a lot of time up there using celestial navigation and working with the navigator and where we are and what we were doing and, you know, figuring out how to employ the weapon systems and so on based on all those different things that we'll talk about. Um, now, to get into a little bit of kind of how big of an area we're talking about. Most of my service was in the North Pacific and the South Pacific. Big, big ocean, as we all know. And as you can see in the bottom left-hand corner, this is a picture of me, I think when I was on the USS New Jersey navigating, and there's a couple of ships in the background, but it's huge. And, you know, I, I saw a statistic and it said that, you know, the Pacific Ocean is bigger than all the land masses on Earth combined. Uh, so to give you a sense, because the numbers are just the number, 63.8 million square miles and the Atlantic's only 41. But our ship transited from San Francisco over here to Pearl Harbor. And that transit, and, you know, we're in, we're in a Navy ship, so we we're going pretty quick. Uh, it, it routine transit for merchants, maybe 10 to 12 knots. We were going about 18 to 20 knots, which is pretty fast when it, when you think about it uh, for a ship going across the ocean. It took seven days. And then from Hawaii to Pearl Harbor, I'm sorry, Pearl Harbor to Subic Bay here in the Philippines took 14 days. So it took a long time and we didn't make a lot of detours. We had some maneuvers and we were doing some operations, but it's a long, long transit. And when I, I say that, just to give you a sense for the size of the Pacific Ocean, but also let you know that as much as this is going to seem somewhat complicated, this was before the internet, of course. Um, we had a lot of time to practice. We had a lot of time at sea, um, sometimes, you know, fair uh, conditions to do navigation and celestial navigation, sometimes not so good, but you just had a lot of time and there wasn't really a lot else to do besides watch movies at night or, you know, do your, you know, stand your watches. And when you were standing your watches, you really had to get pretty good at some of these tools like, like navigation uh, by the, by the stars. Okay. So to give you a nice, a sense, I, I want to share with you the ways we navigate, but remember this, that we've been traveling on the um, seas for thousands of years. And the simple goal was where are we and where are we going? And so when we think about breaking this down a little bit, we have basically four types. There's terrestrial navigation, which is piloting and that's a concept of what we call dead reckoning. And, and the, the derivation of that is sort of deduced reasoning and somehow that came, became uh, the term dead reckoning or DR. The, the piloting is obviously for coastal and inland waters. Then we have celestial, which we're gonna spend all of our time tonight on, the sun, the moons, the stars, the planets. Looking at the regularity of the, in the motion of these heavenly bodies, you're able to figure out where you are and where you're going. You're all familiar probably now with some of what we call that more electronic or satellite navigation. Um, in the old days, we used to use radio direction finding. Now um, the Navy uses GPS, which that acronym stands for United States Space Force. So Space Force is responsible for GPS. Uh, the Russians or the Soviets in the old days used to use a, a system called GLONASS. And then the EU had launched a system uh, about five years ago called Galileo. And those are all like a GPS sort of equivalent. Um, each group wanted to have sort of their own. And the reason being is because you'll find out later, it's very difficult to take out a satellite, but it's pretty easy to jam GPS 
And guess what? If they jam GPS and you don't know where you are and where you're going, there's, you have a lot of problems. So <clears throat> when GPS first came out, for example, very high, highly classified system. We used to use them in the ships or the submarines or on land. And then, as you know, a lot of times military things become commercial. And that's where the version of GPS that you use today is sort of the civilian version, whereas there's still other bands and other um, more classified versions of GPS, a uh, little harder to jam and so on, that are used by the, the US military. And then I'll mention the last one is the inertial, which is gyroscopes and accelerometers. Very, very important for submarines. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I was on a submarine that you know surfaced every now and again. Uh, that was a fast attack submarine, but there's other kinds of submarines that go underwater that carry ballistic missiles, um, you know, are part of our nuclear triad, and they'll su submerge for three months and never surface. So it's very important for them to be able to know where they're going, what they're doing by using gyroscopes, accelerometers, and a few other things that I probably isn't at liberty to talk about. So we'll just skip that, but they use a lot of inertial um, um, navigation. So we're gonna spend our time mostly on obviously the celestial. This is a very, very old science. Um, I like to use the ancient Polynesians because they sailed the Pacific from 1500 BC to 1300 AD. Around 1300 AD is when they kind of really settled. Um, and the Polynesians, so I'm going, going through this, they, they, they covered this whole area here. They came from Southeast Asia and they, they basically dotted and inhabited all these islands in here. So vast, vast distances. Um, they use the sun, the moon, the stars, the planets, ocean currents, clouds, all kinds of things to navigate this vast expanse across the Pacific. They also use Polaris in the north. Um, they called it uh, Hokupa and Newe, the Southern Cross in the south to determine the direction. Because as we all know, we can use Polaris points north and the Southern Cross can help us find south, but that just gives us direction. It doesn't tell us exactly where we are. Where we are. They also use the rising, the setting of the constellations, um, different times of the year to determine where they're going. And we know this because um, this voyaging canoe, the Hokulea, actually in 2017 circumnavigated the whole earth using just these techniques. So we're back on um, the age of discovery now. We're getting a little closer to our time frame. Um, European navigators traveled all over the world. Um, Africa, Asia, the Americas, Pacific, and so on. And latitude was pretty easy to determine, but it was longitude that was much, much more challenging because you had to use spherical uh, trigonometry and you needed really accurate clocks. So around uh, 1727 to 1761, John Harrison basically cr created a chronometer, which is just a word for an accurate clock that was super, super accurate. Um, and what he was trying to do was figure out how can we determine longitude how do we do that? You've got to compare your time to where you're at to Greenwich Mean Time. And then you, um, you, you do some measurements. But believe it or not, measuring longitude is very difficult. A lot of the ancient sailors, when I say ancient, I mean in, you know, in the 14, 1500s, they would just sail a latitude all the way across. They never knew where they were sort of in a longitudinal sense. Around 1731, the sextant came out. And again, um, with this advent of time, very accurate time, which today, you know, a cheap little $10 watch can probably tell as good a time as this chronometer, which costed, I think they gave them 5,000 pounds back in that day, which is equivalent of uh, several million dollars in today's something like that to, to create this, these clocks. But anyway, so they're able to do that. And as you can see, we started getting better and better at our ability to know where we are and where we're going. Um, so again, if you look at this timeline, you can see, obviously it doesn't even go back to where the Polynesians were, but the wind and the birds and you know land features all the way up to almanacs, looking at marine clocks, which is a little closer to home we talked about, the sextant, and then you know getting up to electronic navigation. So made a lot of progress in the last couple hundred years, but again, you can do all this you know without all the, the fancy tools. So before we get into celestial navigation, I got to give you a quick in, uh, overview of what dead reckoning is. And so what you do when you dead reckon is you just basically work from a last known position. So when you leave the harbor, you know you're at the harbor, you know your course and speed, and you just plot it out. And you'll see an example here what it looks like. So here was the harbor at 1430. Again, we use military time. We know we were here. We're on course 150. 
we're at speed 12 and we just can work with the, you know, with the, with the uh, distance equation here, distance equals speed times time. We can figure out at least deduce where we're at at 1430. Don't worry so much about this. We, you know, obviously you, you do sail in one direction, but there's currents, you know, you think you're going in one direction, but you're actually moving a little bit because of uh, what we call these, these terms set and drift. You move around a little bit. It, unfortunately, it's not like a road where you go straight. When you're going through the ocean, a lot of things can, can change your course a bit. But for tonight's purposes, we're just going to focus on, let's assume we sail like in the direction we're always heading. So now we move to celestial navigation. And all celestial navigation is, is we're finding an unknown position from a known position. Um, if we have some information, we can deduce the rest. And we're going to use and we're going to talk about sextants and the planets and the stars and the horizon. It gets pretty complicated. You do use spherical trigonometry. But fortunately for us, a lot of really smart people put together a lot of um, publications in different books to help us do this. So we wouldn't have to do the math at sea because it is um, like uh, many sailors of old, including myself, weren't great at math all the time. So we needed to have these sort of uh, calculations predetermined for us. And then you figure out uh, your distance toward or away from the celestial object, and then you draw a line of position. A lot of words. Let me show you some pictures, make it a little bit easier for you. So I like to start with the end in mind oftentimes in, in my presentations. This is what we're trying to drive to. On the left-hand side, you see um, an example of an app you can download for like $15 to help you do this. So it has all the tables and all the information in there. You plug in your numbers and you get this little thing here called a fix, which is here you see Pollux, Shirdar, and Betelgeuse. You can see where they all intersect somewhere in here is the, whoops, clicked on it, is the fix. On a chart, this is what it would look like. In this case, they used um, Arcturus, Vega, and Eloth, and you can see where the three intersect is your position on your Latin long. And that's where, it, so you, you know with pretty good certainty where you're at. And normally for star fixes, we'll talk about this in a minute, but um, star fixes, you want to have at least two or three. Three is better. You get a much tighter fix, so you know where you're at. And again, a fix is just saying kind of where you're at. That gives you your Latin longitude. You, you take those numbers, you put them on a chart, and then from there, you, you continue your navigation. And uh, in a moment, I'll show you how that works over the course of a day at sea. Some of the tools we use, um, a compass. And on a, in the, on a Navy ship, we use a gyro compass, which always points to true north. And it's an electronic version. Uh, very, very accurate, which is great. You want to use that. But you can use a magnetic compass. You just have to make an adjustment. A chronometer. Always set the Greenwich Mean Time, because that's, that's the key. You have plotting tools to help make the job a bit easier. You have charts, which I'll show you in a moment. The publications, what I was referring to earlier, they're called technically called site reduction tables. And there's a lot of intricate little measurements and adjustments you have to make based on your observations. That'll get you to where you want to in terms of Latin longitude. But again, all the trigonometry um, on a sphere, spherical trigonometry is figured out for you. So you just have to be able to look up numbers like what time you took to fix, um, what your position is and so on. And I'll give you an example of that. Sextant you need, of course. You need a star finder unless you're good at looking at the stars. Um, old fashioned star finder with the wheel works fine. But for some of you that can look at the heavens and know where you're at even better. Computer programs today here, again, make this a lot easier. You plug in your numbers and it gives you a quick fix. And then finally, when all else fails, you have your GPS receiver, and I'll give an example. When we were on the ship, when we were transiting, our captain would often, often get a piece of duct tape and put it right over the GPS numbers, so we couldn't cheat and didn't know. You know, we had to get, we had to find the solution and say where we're at without having to look up at the the monitor telling us, you know, our Latin longitude via the satellite. Um, so anyway, this is a typical nautical chart. Um, in this case, San Francisco, I was stationed here on Treasure Island, and we would transit up and around through here under the Golden Gate Bridge and then out to sea. Um, charts are for the Navy and for nautical. Maps, like I showed you earlier, are more uh, land or navigation. Um, so that's a difference in terms. A chart is, is nautical and a chart is more land. Um, this is where you would use piloting and you'd use different reference points all around here to figure out where you are exactly because you want to make this transit right through here. 
uh, with very little leeway because there's not a lot of room for error in some of these places, especially outside here where there's tons of sailboats all the time and right around here around Alcatraz you run into things. So you just got to be very, very accurate when you're when you're doing that. Um, that's why this chart is really helpful. Um, give me an example of what that looks like. So here's a bunch of Navy people up here. Um, the difference you'll notice between a, a, a merchant mariner, there'll be like two people on the bridge on a Navy ship, there'll be like 10 doing navigation. You know, one's looking, um, one's spotting uh, the, the figures for you. Somebody over here is probably yelling at somebody for doing something wrong. There's just a whole bunch of things going on there. But this is obviously pulling into a harbor. Um, this is an example of what the bridge might look like on a typical Navy ship today. And then here I give you an example. This is refueling at sea. You can see these fueling lines from the oiler going to this um, helicopter carrier and then going to this ship over here. This requires very precise ship handling. But again, the oiler is going to be maybe 60, 70 miles from you. And you have to figure out a rendezvous point. You want to be good at navigation so that your rendezvous point works out really well and quickly. Otherwise, you waste their time, they waste your time, and you're burning fuel you don't need to. So Again, this is a complicated ship handling maneuver, but just to bring the ships together themselves, you, you need good navigation. A um, couple other ways, and I'll just go through this really, really briefly. I mentioned piloting, refueling at sea. Your weapon systems all rely on um, navigation. Anti-submarine warfare, as you can see in this really complicated chart here, is very complicated. You need to know where things are. Uh, man overboard drills. You know, unfortunately, when a carrier battle group goes out to sea, there's maybe 10 ships with it, you'll lose one or two people on every deployment. Someone falls overboard, gets sucked up in a jet on deck here. Something bad will happen. Unfortunately, life at sea is very difficult. Um, so you want to be able to, um, you know, use that uh, navigation and such for, for, and good ship handling for man overboard drills. Freeing and navigation, obviously very important in the South China Sea. Um, you know, you have this 12 nautical mile limit and you're not supposed to cross it. Um, we don't recognize these reefs, so we cross them all the time. That's called freedom of navigation. But if you're near a uh, country's territorial waters, you need to know where you're at, because if you're within 12 nautical miles, that's considered an aggressive action. Um, and then just backups. I think what often happens on a ship, believe it or not, is your electronics will go down, your generators will kick back in, your systems will come back up, but there's a lag there. And sometimes your systems don't all work. Sometimes there's jamming going on. Sometimes there's just battle damage. Um, not so much recently, obviously, but you need to know how to navigate in these, what I call more austere conditions. Okay, so let's get into sort of how this all works and, and the diagrams. This diagram on the far right is gonna scare you. Um, don't get scared. This is the whole solution on the right-hand side. You're trying to solve through spherical trigonometry for that grayish triangle up in here. But we're going we're gonna to take you slowly through it so you can understand sort of what we're trying to get to. So from a standpoint of an Earth on the Earth, we talk about latitude. But from a celestial standpoint, we talk about, we call latitude in that terminology in the celestial world, declination. If you're using a telescope, you're probably familiar with some of these terms, obviously. Longitude, um, we, um, on the Earth, when, look, when you look out into the celestial heavens, we talk about our Greenwich hour angle or our GHA. And that's basically measuring your, your distance longitudinally west from the prime meridian. Everything comes off the prime meridian. Some people ask why the prime meridian is Greenwich. Well, in the 1700s, when the British Empire ruled the known world, or, I, or the empire that was the sun never set on the British Empire. Um, they had the biggest Navy and they established the prime meridian and that's um, where it came from. So everything is, is kind of built off of the Greenwich mean time and the prime meridian, which literally runs through Greenwich. The next concept, so we're trying to take terrestrial Latin long and, and bring it with declination and GHA. How do you bring the two together? Well, we use this concept called local hour angle. It sounds a little bit confusing, but basically the LHA connects the terrestrial with the celestial. It's kind of the easiest way to think about it. Um, it's literally just the angle between where we are based on our DR longitude and where the sun is. So in this example here, you might be here. The sun is to the east. Your LHA is just that distance around. 
And then if this is looking at a view from like on from the top of the, the globe, you can see what the this is this is the angle that you're measuring. If the sun is um, in this case, we're using the sun is a little bit to the east. I'm sorry, to the west. Sorry, I got that wrong. The sun's to, to the west of the observer. Then you can see here, this would be your, your LHA right there. Small LHA. And we use LHA without going into a lot of detail. It's the local hour angle. It's, the, it's your time basically um, versus the Greenwich hour angle where, you know, where, where, men, where it's measured from, from uh, the prime meridian to determine your assumed lat and your assumed longitude. There are some calculations. I think I'll skip them for now, but there's a way to figure out if you know your LHA and you know the GHA, you can figure out your assumed longitude or, or, or any of the above. Usually, you know, GHA, you can look it up in the pub. You can, you can calculate your LHA from where you are here. Subtract the angles. I did a little math down there for you, but again, this is fundamental. So we don't go into detail, but, and then you can, then you can find your assumed longitude. <clears throat> again, we're trying to find latitude and longitude so we can plot that on a chart. Hey Vince, uh, you had one it's question. It's an interesting, um, it's an interesting uh, graphic. I won't go through it all. I'm just gonna leave it here in case you wanna copy the presentation later. But I thought it was interesting to show the earth, the celestial equator, the horizon and the elliptic and how these terms are very, very similar and how they compare. Uh, again, I won't go through all the details here, but the ones we're concerned with is sort of this, the celestial um, and then you know the horizon, because that's what we're gonna be looking at when we do our calculations and our observations of the skies. So here is our, yeah, go ahead, Jim. Yeah, got questions? Yep. We have one question come in uh, on Facebook. Uh, Chris asks, are the nautical charts the same for military and civilian or are they different? Um, great question. And they're actually, um, they're similar. So um, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association, National Ocean Atmospheric Association, <clears throat> that group and the Coast Guard produce all the charts. And uh, we use the same ones in the Navy as you would if you just could sort of purchased them. Most, most of them are, are electronic now. Uh, but for some of us old school navigators, you like to still keep a paper chart. The only time that you'll see a difference is if you're transiting some more sensitive areas, then you might have a special chart um, designed by the uh, Defense Mapping Agency. But quite frankly, you don't use those too much for navigation. Um, you use them for other things. Uh, but very, very similar charts. So the ones I was showing you will be the ones that the Navy would use or you would use if you bought them along the way. Okay. Any other questions, Jim, before I dive into my big triangle here? Uh, that's all so far. Okay. All right. This will scare you and it scared me. And I couldn't remember any, what any of these words meant when I first looked at this uh, <laughs> several months ago. Don't worry about it. You're solving again for this red triangle here. And I'm going to take you into smaller bits. By the end of the presentation, this will all make sense to you. Um, but for now, I just wanted to show you what the final solution looks like before it gets actually plotted onto a chart, just to give you an idea. So just look at this as a pretty fancy picture. Um, your celestial body over here on the left, what you're, you're uh, looking at and you're using as one of your things to fix on. But let's go simple and, and make it make sense along the way. Okay, so we're gonna use the sun first because obviously the sun's biggest object in the sky for us to use when we're out to sea. And if you imagine the sun was directly overhead at a particular time, and when I say particular, I mean hours, minutes, and seconds because you really need to be very accurate on the time. Um, being a little bit off will, will make a big difference on your where your plot ends up. So all you gotta do is imagine the sun's directly overhead at a certain time. You'd pull out the nautical almanac, which is, yeah, you probably can't read this, but it's a, a bunch of pages and charts. In this case, it was this is 2002, May 10th, 11th, and 12th. And then it gives you all these different points. Aries, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, the sun right here, and it'll tell you exactly where you're at. Um, that's where you're at. Very simple. Problem is, we're probably not in a position where the sun is directly overhead. Um, so, and that's obviously because we're not, you know, um, usually in that place out to sea. But you're probably a little bit off. So let's think about this. If the sun were one degree off of overhead, and say your sextant reads 89 degrees, right? You would be somewhere within a circle of 60 nautical miles because 60 nautical miles equals one degree. 
So that gives you a little bit of a better idea. We call this a circular line of position of where you're at in the globe. Not great because we're 60 knot miles, right? It's a big radius. What we can do though, is we can take our dead reckoning position, this, and where it crosses that circle that you made on the previous slide, that's where you're at. Now that could be somewhat accurate because that line could go through two sides of the circle, right? So what do we do? We take another sun site and with the intersection of these two circles, we're either in this point or this point. That's the basic theory of kind of taking a sun line. You could take a third site and, and kind of fine tune it. You can draw your, your dead reckoning track right through it. And you probably have a pretty good position uh, idea of kind of where you're at. That's and This is the very, very simple theory. You need to do a lot of calculations and a few other things to really be more accurate. But this is basically the theory of kind of how to figure out where you are in terms of position. So how we do that is this, we use this, this thing called a sextant. Um, what does it mean? I actually um, looked this up because I thought it was very interesting. It means the sixth part. And the sixth part of a circle is 60 degrees. Yeah, so that's six times three, six, or 60 times six is 360. Um, and it was called that because early sextants could only measure 60 degrees at the time. Um, supposedly it was imagined by Newton in 1669, but John Hadley's the one who actually developed this in 1731. What is it? It's a protractor. It's just a really fancy one. And they cost anywhere from $100 to $1,000, depending on the version you get. Um, but it's just, you have the frame, and then you have the index arm here. And all it does is it measures between two lines of sight. Um, basically, one celestial body could be the sun or a star, and then the horizon. And out to sea, the nice thing about being out to sea is you can see the horizon very, very well. There's very few obstructions when you're out in the middle of that Pacific Ocean. Um, give you an idea of uh, how this actually works, I'll talk about in a second. But when you're shooting stars, you have a really small window of time. You can see this sort of nice picture up here between sunrise and sunset, um, or, or when it's right before sunrise and sunset, part sort of that twilight time to actually um, use your sextant to measure because you've got to be able to see that her celestial body, maybe it's Venus or maybe it's a star, and you still have to be able to see the horizon. So if it's pitch black, you won't be able to, um, to, to use your sextant. So you got a kind of a small window when you're doing when you're shooting stars or planets or things like that. When you're shooting the sun, you've got a lot, tons of time. You've got the whole day and you can shoot a lot of sun lines and I'll show you an example of that in a moment. Then what you do is once you have your observation, you make a bunch of corrections. Um, again, you can use the nautical almanac and site reduction tables, or you can just use the electronic systems they have today and they can do this calculation for you um, automatically. And then when you get, that's for, that gives you the, your, your latitude and then, um, you're going to solve for uh, longitude using time and then other other reduction tables. So we'll, we'll get into that in just a moment too. I'm going to show you how a sextant works by video just here real quick. I just love this old salty picture of this Royal Navy guy. Uh, so I thought I'd throw it in there. So how does it work? Um, this is an example, <clears throat> a couple different examples. Here's a very, very simple example. The sun coming in, reflecting off the mirror and kind of going into the eye. I really like this one. I thought this was the best way to describe it. Light from the sun, star, or the moon bounces off this mirror, comes into your eye. And so you're looking at the horizon and you're solving and you're bringing the sun down here to the horizon to figure out what the angle is. So this is when you look through the sextant, when you first see that this is the sun, obviously, and there's a nice filter on this, the sun's going to be much higher up. You're going to use this index arm here to bring the sun down. So in theory, it would be great to do this, but you really can't. You want to bring it either to the lower limb of the sun, which is what just this version is, or that you can use an upper limb if you want. And that's going to give you a reading on your sextant down here in, in, some, in some numbers. And then you have some, uh, some fine tuning that happens over here. Um, and that gives you your uh, you know, what we call your, um, your uh, sextant um, azimuth. And we're going to talk about that in just a moment, how you use that number to help you determine your latitude and your longitude using the different tables. Let me show you a quick video though. I think it'll, it'll help quite a bit. And you can still see my screen, right? Or no, you can't see it. Uh, right now I don't see anything. 
yeah, let me just, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it a little differently. Let me stop sharing. Here we go. There we go. You see it now, right, Jim? Yes. Okay, great. And this gentleman here, uh, he, he creates, he, it builds sextants if you want to buy one. Uh, great company, Celestier. A sextant is a very simple machine that's basically one moving part, but it has two mirrors on it, a mirror here and a mirror here. The top one is the one that moves. Having two mirrors lets you see two things at once, like a double, double exposure. It can be two people in this room. It can be the, uh, the sun in the sky or whatever it is. This tells you the angle between them. It's just a simple angle measuring thing. If it's one degree away from overhead, the sextant would read uh, 89 degrees up. You would be on a circle of one degree, which is 60 miles. You'd be on a circle around where the sun is. And you can actually plot that circle on your chart if you wanted to. Then when the sun moves to another point of the sky later on in the day, you can do the whole thing again and get another circle. And where the circles intersect, you're at one of those points. That's how celestial navigation works. That's the whole course. If you ever do play golf, the first day you go out, you will play golf. I mean, you're bound to hit the ball once in a while and you're gonna lose a lot of golf balls and get a very high score but you are playing golf the first day and you can do the same thing with celestial navigation. And it has the same attraction for you later on because you can add things, you can, you can shoot planets in the daytime, you can do all kinds of tricks, the moon at night and doing all kinds of things with it. And so some people make a hobby of it just throughout their lives just to try to get better. Okay, so I thought that was just, you know, one of the easiest ways I've ever seen uh someone describe, uh, you know, how to use a sextant in a very simple way. So let me go back. Oh, did I lose them? Hello? Yeah, we're still here. Oh, sorry, okay, I just wanna make sure. Sometimes my thing goes off. So you guys can see my screen again, right? The, uh, the YouTube screen. Yeah, let me go back. All righty. And I go back to my PowerPoint. Okay, now you can see that, right? Perfect. Okay. So it, it takes, um, takes a little time and effort. I know um, he explained it very simply, but you have to sort of measure it. You got to bring it down to the horizon. You have to rock it a little bit. There's a little bit of technique to it, but I'll tell you, when you spend that much time at sea, like I did, you, you get pretty good at this pretty quickly. You can, you, you, your skills will, will ramp up. Really important when you get that sun down to this line here, exact time. I mean, hours, minutes, and seconds, because you're gonna go into the tables to do some corrections. And if you're off by just a little bit, it'll, it'll, it'll throw off your, your actual calculation. Um, so again, what you're trying to do here is you're trying to figure out um, your observed altitude. Right, this is what we're, what we're solving for. Your observe altitude, it's either here or maybe it's here. You might not be sure of what that is. Um, so you do a little bit of math and you do a little bit of reasoning around uh, how we think about this in terms of if it's, if you're closer to the sun, then um, you know the intercept is gonna be towards, we call it, your observed is more towards, homo to, it's a term we used. And then there's another term if it's if you're further away. Why that matters is because when you actually make this plot, you're gonna, you, I'll show you in just a moment why it's important because you're either gonna plot away or, or towards. So let me take you through a very simple example. So let's assume that we're at latitude 31, right here across here, even 31. Your longitude is 54 degrees west, 12.1 minutes. Right, so you're right about here. That's your. That's going to be your AP or your assumed position. <clears throat> now, what you're going to do after that is you're going to take your azimuth, which is the the um, acronym is the Z and a small n, and you're going to you're going to it, the azimuth that you have is one five zero. So you're going to you're going to one five zero is here. So you're going to basically 
use parallel rulers to kind of move it to here because you want to plot it through this assumed position. Okay, this line here and this arrow here indicates sort of the uh, where the sun is at the time that you were looking at that doing that um, uh, sighting. So you take the assumed position and we know that let's make the assumption because we didn't do the calculations in, the, in this example, but I did them earlier that your calculated azimuth is greater than your observed azimuth. In that case, you're going to plot away. So you're going to plot, you're going to use this logarithmic table here with your dividers to plot here sort of away. And this is the distance here. You're going to put a little tick right there. Then what you're going to do is you're going to draw this big thick line perpendicular to this line. So in this case, if our um, azimuth was 150, I just add 90 and I just draw a line here. And this is your sun line. So this is what you're trying to draw, de derive here. So, and then you just, you put the label at 1132 is the time you do it. Obviously when you calculate, you do calculate hours, minutes, and seconds. However, when you label on the chart, you just keep it simple um, for that. So where this in this cross is your position. So as you can see, where, and this is where you're, and this is your line right here, the sun line that, you, that you've drawn. So remember this when we go into my example for the day. Whenever you get a line of from from your observed, you're going to draw your line of position perpendicular to that. Just it just a it's a it's a plotting technique, and I don't want to go into the details of why that is, but it's just this is just the way they do that. Um, so you can get a, what we call this a sun your sun line here. Let me give another example. So here we are, um, and I'm going to use a couple of different examples to kind of work you to that. At you know um, your dead reckoning, so 0800. This is your dead reckoning. This is the terminology, and we did some calculations, and we realized that we were a little bit off. So again, it's deduced reasoning, but we did the calculation. We did a some kind of a, um, a sun line here, and and our, we moved to this position here, and it's used as by a square in the terminology. Sometimes we're going to what we use what we call a running fix, where we just take our 80800 uh, sighting, and we just move it forward to this time frame, 1100 in this case. And then where these lines cross is a running fix. I'll give, I'll give you another example of that in a moment. And then this is an example of three lines of positions that cross, like I showed you earlier on that chart. Um, so these are probably going to be, in this case, they're probably a star maybe a planet, something like that. And where you get right in that little hat there, that, that triangular cocked hat, we call it, like those old fashioned hats that uh, they used to wear back in the 1700s, right in the middle there is where your position is. So DR is good, EP is better, running fix is even better, and then a real fix is excellent. That's a great Latin longitude. So that's kind of how the hierarchy works. So before I go to the day at sea, I wanted to just give you a couple other examples. Um, we can easily get our latitude from Polaris. Um, we all know Polaris doesn't set at night. It points to true north, and it's an easy way to determine latitude. And all it really is is the angle of the pole over the horizon equals latitude. That's it. Uh, with a few quick corrections, um, and you'll go into some tables to do that, one side of Polaris, you can figure out where your latitude is. doesn't give you longitude, but it can at least give you latitude, so it's a piece of the equation. We can use stars. Obviously, we're going to use a lot of stars um, when we can, when they're visible and when they're bright. Um, the GHA is what we use that Greenwich hour angle is typically what the term we use um, when we're shooting the sun. But when we do it with, um, with stars, we use the GHA of Aries because that's a benchmark in the sky. It kind of circles the earth at the same time and speed as the stars. And we use this concept, which I'm sure you heard of before, this sidereal hour angle, which is the star hour angle um, in a sense. I think that's uh, I'm, that sidereal is a derivation of, of that. Um, so we're going to use all these different things because when you're navigating at sea, you know, you, you don't know what you're going to get. You might have a cloudy day. Planets might not be visible. You might be in a different position. Um, Hopefully the sun's out, but if it's a cloudy day, it's not. So you've got to rely on different things. So you're going to use combinations of stars, the moon, and now planets. In this case, um, the four planets we typically use are Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn for obvious reasons. They're the most visible. Um, 
as we know that they're they're bright, they don't twinkle. So that makes it easier when you're using your sextant to make sure you've got it in the right spot. Um, you shoot the planets right after sunset in the evening and, and almost till sunrise in the morning, meaning right around uh, the time where you can see that horizon and you can see that star. Um, common practice, shoot planets in conjunction with stars and or the moon. The moon's a little harder. I won't go into the details of how to do the moon. It, believe it or not, it's so bright that sometimes it's a little bit makes it makes it a little bit more confusing. There is a way to use the moon and a lot of folks do use the moon, but the most of the time you're gonna use the sun, the stars and planets and the tables that I mentioned, those different publications that they have available will, will point you in the right direction depending on what you're using. Combinations are great and I'm gonna show you combinations in just a second. Um, another scary chart, but let me just let, give you a simple, simple uh, explanation of this. So we observe something with our sextant, right? We did some uh, corrections with these manuals and different things, depending on how tall you are and your angle above the horizon and all these other factors. And you're gonna get something up here. We know where we're at based on our dead, dead reckoning. We assumed our latitude and longitude. And then we use, again, we use a bunch of publications we get figure out our Greenwich hour angle, our local hour angle, and a bunch of other things to get to a couple of numbers up here that will that will help us get to our Latin longitude. Again, this is a the actual detailed example. And if you were taking a class in celestial navigation, it probably would last several months. Maybe it'd be about 15 to 18 different chapters. This visual will be very helpful to sort of have in your back pocket because once you once you learn what all these terms mean, you can pull it all together quickly. And this just then you're like, oh yeah, okay, I got my sextant, I have my DR position, my assumed Latin longitude, I've got my pubs, I can figure out everything else. And so I just leave it in here again for future reference if you want to use it um, as a good visual. This is what it looks like um, when you do it with the tables. So we have our observations up here of these two stars, El um, Elcade and Capella. We do a bunch of corrections. We know our assumed or our DR, I should say our DR Latin Longe. We know um, our GHA, our Greenwich Hour Angle. We, use, we know our Sidereal Hour Angle because we're going to find all this in the pubs. Make some more corrections. We know what our local hour angle is. Make some more corrections. And then we find our angles to plot. This should scare you. It scared me when I first saw it. When I had to do my first one, I was really nervous. And I was probably like this guy over here looking up at the, G the GPS going, okay, where am I really at? So I can kind of fudge it. Because <laughs> these are a bunch of Navy guys. This guy's actually doing the, the work right here. This one's probably cheating, right? <laughs> and these guys are kind of helping out. But I make a joke because this stuff is not easy. But once you figure out how to do some of these calculations, you can start to do them very quickly and they make a lot of sense. Again, this is a fundamentals class, so I'll skip the details. But at the end of the day, what you're doing here is you have your assumed lot, 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 latitude. You have your star points of where your assumed longitude is for those stars. You draw your lines. You draw your perpendiculars. And guess what? Where they cross, where Capella and LK cross, this is your 804, 2004 position. Now your dead reckoning said you would have been here on course 288 speed 6.8 knots, but your actual fix puts you here. Now to most people, it might not seem like it's that big of a deal. You're just a little bit off, but a little bit off uh, at this scale is you could be in a whole different place where you need to be. Um, you know, one or two degrees off and you're gonna miss the island or you're gonna miss that rendezvous point. Or you're gonna miss whatever. Cause again, you're out in the middle of the open ocean. Okay, so that gives you an idea. So without scaring you with all the numbers here, you're just trying to figure out with a bunch of corrections and um, calculations, how can you get these two points to cross and where they cross is your fix. Okay, Jim, any questions? I'm gonna go through my day at sea and we're gonna, we're gonna close it out with sort of some example of what a navigator's day looks like. Uh, we do not have any questions. Okay. Okay, hopefully I'm not confusing you guys too, too much. So this is, um, you know, as a navigator on a ship, uh, whether you're commercial or military, doesn't matter. You're, you're gonna spend a lot of time um, doing celestial navigation or just navigating. And there's different ways to do it. Um, 
here's just a couple of examples. And one nice thing I can tell you about being out to sea without, we do have a little bit of light pollution because you have to have running lights on ships, as you can see here. But when it's dark or twilighty, th these are like actual pictures uh, of what the sky looks like. It's just absolutely gorgeous because you're out in the middle of nowhere. There's no light pollution. And, you know, from my perspective, I used to be able to look at and find all the constellations. When you're out here, you, it's hard to see them because this, there's so many stars. You got to really have uh, good eyesight. Um, here's a young uh, sailor. She's taking a sextant, probably a noon sight. This is more in the twilight. And this is indoors where you're putting it all together. So we'll talk about a morning twilight, a sun line. You always want to do a noon sight if you can with the sun. Shoot the sun in the afternoon. Shoot the sun as much as you can because it's going to be helpful. You'll do a final line of position. You'll do some stars at night, and then you'll put it all under the chart. That's kind of how you put it all together. So hopefully this will make sense as I go through it. So here's what, this, what the diagram looks like, and we'll take you step by step. So in the morning twilight, we took Saturn at 0530. We took Spike at 0530 in Antares, and we got a really nice fix. Again, we, if I go back here, we did all this stuff on the chart to get to those lines of position, but let's just fast forward to we're right here. Then we draw out our course 120 speed seven, and we just draw it out. And we hope we're gonna, we're, I'm sorry, we're gonna be going down that path. And at 830, we, the sun's up. So now we can take a sun line. And when we take our sun line, we figure out we're a little bit off and we adjust this DR to get to an estimated position, which is a little bit more accurate than we DR off of that. So that's kind of the, what we've done in the morning a bit to get to that point. Now we're a little bit later in the morning. Um, we did a, we did a, uh, the sun um, is coming up. So again, perpendicular to the sun would be this line this way, right? Because it's going to run perpendicular to where the sun is up over the horizon. This is where we had at 0, 0930. Our DR said we're here, but our we, we corrected it with our sun line. So we got a little bit better. We went from here to here, at least on our, on our chart. We draw out our course. And we do what we call a running fix without going into the details. We just took this 830 and we moved it to 1040. Um, we drew this line. We did a quick sun sight to get our sun line here at 1040. And where this advanced line and our sun sight cross is what we call a running fix. So instead of being here at 1040, we're actually here. And then we DR out from there. Okay. Now it's noon. Okay. So the sun's up. Uh, it's 1210 local um, apparent noon per the nautical almanac. We shoot the sun to get our latitude here. And then in, in, in previous example, we advanced our 930 position. And where those two cross, we got our 1210 fix. Again, our DR said we were going to be here, but we did some nice celestial navigation and we ended up right here. And again, I don't have scale for you on there. But those little bit of differences here could be, you know, many, many miles, which would be a very, very big difference. So you're really you're trying to adjust where you think you're going to be with where you're at. Then in the afternoon, the sun's still up. So we're going to take some more sun sights. We know the sun bears 210, which is somewhere around here going this way. So perpendicular to a line drawn like this would be here. And again, we thought we were going to be here at 1420. But with the sun line now, we know we're actually here on our estimated position. So we're fine tuning as we go along on, on our voyage. Now we, um, we have a little bit more time before twilight. And so we do an afternoon fix at 1530. We find our new estimated position. Whoops, sorry. A little bit off, we draw our course. We do one more sun sight um, at, um, 1650 here, right there. So the sun's at 270. So the perpendicular line, again, for the chart is here. And then we know where this line crosses. This line here, the advance, we know we're right there. And then we draw it from there. And then my funnest part of doing funnest, if that's a word, uh, of doing slush shows when we could do the stars and the planets. That was always more fun. The sun's great because it's easy. It's big. Um, it's easy to shoot sun lines. It's probably where you start when you're doing celestial navigation. But when you can shoot stars and planets, that's where it gets really fun. So we shot Arcturus, Venus, the Moon, and Capella. 
And look at this, we got a fantastic fix. Now, how do we know to use Arcturus, Venus, Moon, and Capella, this example? Well, before you go out at night or twilight, you've got a very short window of time in the twilight. So you do some work ahead of time to figure out what stars we think will be out, what planets, maybe the moon, et cetera. And we, know, we want to know when twilight is because, again, we're going to be using that sextant. We're going to be um, trying to compare that celestial body, Arcturus, Venus, et cetera, with the horizon. So we want to, you know, we have a short window of time. So we got to really do our homework and get ready. So at 2045, in this case, we got to fix using those four different celestial bodies and put us right here, which is great. And when you put this all together, you can see we started here early in the morning at 0530. We did a bunch of sun sights over the course of the day. And then in the evening, we got this nice fix. This doesn't always happen. This is kind of a great to see four points. You can shoot two stars, a planet and, and the moon, and you're right here. And again, I don't have a scale for you to show you, but this these little adjustments don't seem like much, but they can make a significant difference depending on where you're going, especially if you're not traveling the same course and speed all the time. You know, for a merchant vessel, you will do that probably because you're, you know, you're going from point A to point B, right? You're, you're, you're delivering goods. 90% uh, of the world's uh, uh, goods travel on the sea. So, you're, you know, you want to get there quickly and, you know, in the shortest distance. But a Navy ship, like I mentioned earlier, you might be doing man overboard drills. You might be anti-submarine warfare drills. You might be doing battle group operations. When that carrier decides to turn into the wind, um, they don't tell you. And you could be trying to navigate. And then also you got to avoid a carrier coming at you, which is kind of scary. So it makes it more difficult. Um, and so you don't really get to travel this sort of nice course and speed all the time. So that's why taking these different fixes along the way is really, really important. Um, to make sure you know where you're at. And again, you kind of know where you're going. Um, you know your course and speed. You know what you know, you're going maybe from Pearl Harbor to Subic Bay in my case, but along the way, you want to make sure um, you're keeping accurate track of that. So we come back to where we started. Um, we were solving for different parts of this triangle. If you know two sides in, in the angle, you can solve for it. We are very fortunate that very smart people created tables for us. You'll see a lot of the old time sailors will, you know, have pubs in their, uh, you know, in the, um, uh, in the uh, bridge uh, or on the bridge, I should say, or in the, in the nav locker, wherever it may be, because guess what? If your GPS stops working, you run out of batteries. If it breaks um, either due to negligence or, you know, in, in my case, the Navy ship, you know, if there's a some kind of battle damage, um, you know, you have to know how to do these things because you might not get your GPS back up online quick enough. Uh, you're out to sea, so your phone probably won't work. We didn't have phones back then um, to catch the GPS unless you got a you know, special kind of satellite phone, which we had those as well. But it's always good to have sort of that backup. Um, the Naval Academy, and I went to school at, uh, our, I was ROTC uh, at Michigan, but um, we learned this early on. They stopped teaching it somewhere around the late 90s, early 2000s, and now they're teaching it again um, for this reason of, you know, you can't always rely on your electronics. It's kind of like that person staring at their phone when they're driving. You know, they're not really paying attention to what's going on around them. And that's what happens when you're ship handling. If you're not paying attention to the world around you, the, the celestial globe, the planets, the stars, and everything else, other ships that are out to sea, you're going to lose sight of things pretty quickly. If you rely too much on your, on your electronics, they can fail. They can give you inaccurate readings. They cannot be calibrated. These things have to be calibrated quite frequently, especially for the, the precision and frequency you need for you know, any kind of navigations or weapon systems. So um, as much as it sounds like a little bit of an error here, there's not a big deal. Uh, it can be a very big deal when you stretch it over, you know, thousands of nautical miles. Hey Vince, that yeah. kind of leads into a question we got. Yeah. Um, so Dave said he has a, has a copy of the 1918 uh, Bowditch's Practical Navigator. Yeah, yeah, yeah great. And he said, do they still use a modern day version of that book? Or do they just use electronic copies? Uh... Um, yes and yes. Um, Bowditch is, is sort of the the, the term. We, you know, they that was the original one. I think it was a, an English gentleman uh, Bowditch that created it. Great to have that. That's probably a collector's item. But yes, they still use both the printed and the electronic. And I can tell you, if you got a ship captain, it's a good ship captain. Um, you know, they have electronics, but that's easy but they will find ways to make it difficult 
Um, you know, they'll even like turn off the receiver sometimes and say, where are you guys at? You know, you need to figure this out. You need to know Celestial. So they'll pull the pubs out and start using them. So it's always good to have that backup. Um, they publish them, I think, they pub I'm, I know they publish them every year, uh, different versions depending on where you're at, what latitude you're at, and, and so on, different parts of the world. But um, most good navigators, depending on where you're going, will have will keep a copy. And then there's a whole system of corrections and updates. And usually that's great if you've got electronic version, because then the corrections and such are done automatically. If they're not, then you'll you'll get periodically, you'll get updates from the Coast Guard or from NOAA or other other places, and they'll tell you what corrections. Usually the tables are pretty good, like Bowditch is really good in the Nautical Almanac and the, the publications I mentioned, 229. HO stands for hydrographic office. It's an old term that the British used to use. Um, pub 249 is for aeronautical navigation, which I never did, but you have to do the same thing when you're flying an airplane. There's a way to do uh, celestial navigation from an airplane. Uh, these publications are frequently updated and you know, you'll get probably a subscription to them. So yeah, I would say yes to both and you should get good with both because you never know when you're gonna need one or the other. Any other questions, Jim? Uh, no, there's not. Okay, so I just wanna thank you. I, I know this is a very dense topic. I try to make it as simple as possible uh, for you. Let me just share one more thing with you, if I could. Uh, let's see here. And I'll close it out on kind of a funny note. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we spend a lot of time at sea and you can get bored. And um, sometimes you just need a little bit of a, of a laugh every now and again. So I'm gonna share this with you. It's another little video. You might find it interesting. Can you see that, Jim? Yes. Okay, I'm gonna put a full screen and I'll hit play. Obviously very fictitious, the ship doesn't even exist, but uh, kind of funny. Again, this is the USS Montana requesting that you immediately divert your course 15 degrees to the north to avoid a collision, over. Please divert your course 15 degrees to the south to avoid collision. This is Captain Hancock. You will divert your course. Over. Negative, Captain. I'm not moving anything. Change your course. Over. I'm sorry. This is the USS Montana, the second largest vessel in the North Atlantic Fleet. You will change course 15 degrees north, or I will be forced to take measures to ensure the safety of this ship. Over. This is a lighthouse, mate. To your call. Okay, so a little bit of fun, um, call it situational awareness. You have to know where you're at and what you're doing, um, obviously, because sometimes you don't want to get in a fight with a lighthouse, no matter how big a ship you are, right? So anyway, I just kind of close with that because a, a very you know complicated topic that I think can be taken to a, a simpler level. Again, we're, we're just trying to figure out where you are, where you're going. You're using a couple different tools and in, in publications. You get good with that sextant and whether you're using the stars, the planets, the moon, the sun, you can figure out uh, pretty easy where you're at. And if you wanna go way back in time, like I mentioned, um, the ancient Polynesians were able to, to, to traverse a huge ocean um, just using some of these more simpler techniques. Uh, so anyone can do it, takes a little practice. It's a lot of fun, it's, it's a great hobby, but you kind of need to be out to see to, to, to really do it right. If you get the opportunity, I would highly encourage it. So um, Jim, I wanna turn it back to you or Drew for any final um, questions. Uh, thank you all very much. If you're interested in getting a copy of the presentation uh, or having a, a further dialogue, I'm happy to do that. I'm happy to share all this information with you at any point. Uh, it's, it's gonna be in the library. So um, thank you again for the time. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Have a good night.